Hey. Wonderful. Such a beautiful walk, walking. Uh, so quiet. And uh, ah, you're by this lovely uh, fig tree. It's a beautiful one, actually, this one, because it's, it's right in the water line down here. No? So it's quite healthy, you can see it's quite healthy. And these figs, they are coming in another maybe maybe another month or so you feel them but uh, well, actually what i'm noticing actually because the the fig trees you know they are um they are not so strong the wood is not so good it's not like a hard wood it's not so strong and uh yeah they are not they are not so strong actually but uh, you can see, with this body and, and really placed in this, um, you know, just in the water line, just at the edge of the water line, it's being fed very, very well. Even in summer, you you would find a tree like this will do very well in this location. And how, even though it's leaning so much into the road, there's an upright one there that keeps also full. What are you doing here? And, and these ones, these are eucalyptus now. Also, these these are very big. And this one particularly is quite beautiful. And you can see that uh, in the forest, because we're in a valley here, the trees they go even more. Everything is competing. You see, to try and reach the reach the sun, to reach the sunlight. And that that's what creates this lovely cocooned feeling as you walk through the forest you feel like you're you're walking in the valley of giants it's very beautiful you know and very quiet i remember in times in india when you see people cook a lot with wood it's very beautiful you see it along the roadside everywhere you know uh, even making chai very often working with um, sometimes wood in the countryside and you come to a place like this, because in India, the wood is not so not so abundant as it is here, like in a place like this. Because all this thing here, all this dried stuff here, no? all of this, you know, can you imagine? You can just take some of these, break it up to start a fire, and you can break eucalyptus and stuff. And you know, there's many, many dinners in here, <laughs> many, many dinners, many warm houses. In fireplaces, in places like this, and it's allowed to once they've cut the trees, and then these these bits that they're not wanted just left to see to rot in the forest, and it looks a bit untidy. It's nature also, and uh, slowly, slowly it rots down, you know. So, what is beautiful? You look at this now. We have some areas like this in the forest. Old trees have fallen, and you see, you have like, look at this, it's beautiful. Mm. So wonderful. You see, these, who plants these? Mm. God plants them through the wind and the, the sun and the seeds, the birds. Mm. Yeah, this is nature, and nature's natural garden. Look at that. So beautiful, all these things. So wonderful. What an arrangement of you know wild flowers, you see. <sighs> so beautiful. So beautiful. These days I uh, there are some things that we have to change because of the present climate of in the world where um, we we are forced to change, and I have to say that it's a good change, true to the pointers that we make. That you, the outer situation of life, um, is not what determines one's happiness. Um, it is how the inner responds to the seeming outer uh, that creates either joy or suffering. 
see. The inner is the greatest. When we see with the eyes of pure consciousness, without the sentiments and the, the speculations, the worries, the tendencies, the habits and addictions of personhood, life, you see, finds its way. Like water running down the hill finds its way. You find your way. And uh, from the place of the real within you, there is no place of worry. All things are accepted as the, the One Self. All the elements and their combinations, everything, and the world, the manifest world, and the One who perceives it and lives in it, all is consciousness. All is consciousness, and um, this is the this is the height of our realization. Uh, not all is consciousness as a philosophical outlook or as an uh, intellectual conviction, but as our living truth. And um, there is no higher capacity within the human construct in some way, the human form, and uh, than to awaken to the truth of ourself as consciousness, because that is the root without which nothing can exist, nothing can appear, nothing is perceived. There is no life without consciousness. It is consciousness that gives life to life. And uh, to come to the point where through introspection and inquiry and knowledge and wisdom, one comes to the place where, of just the soul consciousness, which is not a thing, but that out of which all things appear, but itself is not physically, uh, tangibly recognized, a non-phenomenal recognition uh, awakens in our heart, where we see uh, we are that choiceless uh, substratum the supreme and imperishable, uncreated, unborn, perfect, immutable Self. And this is, this is the, the goal of uh, spiritual research. All spiritual journeys and explorations end in that realization of the single Truth. Uh, we are one. Uh, uh, so. If a little bit of this can percolate through into the consciousness that we that is so often held into the shape of the mind, if that can reach through, it is the medicine of being itself. So God bless you, whoever you are who may be looking at this. God bless you. Truth blesses you. Consciousness blesses you as its own self, actually. That's just one. You know, as we walk walk through the forest, you know, if you're not careful, you you you, it's easy, of course, just out of habit to think, you know, you're just walking through the same forest every day, but. In my world, I, every day the forest is new, uh, because the consciousness is fresh. It's not today's consciousness; it's just ever fresh, and so it sparkles with um, a sensitivity and joy, and everything arises and is perceived in this joy, and so you see the joy in them also without imagination or fantasy actually uh, i see that you know uh, life in its physical man- manifestation is always changeful you know sometimes some changes come that seem very uh, intense and um, the reflex is to you know the reaction come 
like, oh, why is this happening? And oh, we would love to, you know, want it to finish and so on. Because our physical bodies, we feel threatened by it, you know. And usually, it comes down to the fear of the loss of life. But even if the the death of the the body is not really all that death really means. In fact, that's a very small thing, actually. Death, if you want to say something, is to be even alive physically, but unaware of the truth, and that is your fundamental existence. To live in the narrow realm of the mind, I say narrow because when when we are identified with personhood, it might seem to be oh, it's such a big world. Yes, yes, it's big in in size relative to a person, you may say. But the way in which we perceive is very narrow. Very often shaped by conditioning and so on. You see, but when you see from the true light of consciousness, the light that creates and reveals all these things. You know. It is not the biological life that is representative of life. Life is spirit, and life is the dance, the power of the vital force that is the animating power of all living things, and the spirit of God, the spirit of truth. You see? Together, I call just consciousness, including the elemental forms also. And there, are, there's a oneness in it. Of course, if you look and say, but you know, you cannot say things are one because even if you look only at trees, a eucalyptus trees, a eucalyptus tree, and an apple tree are very, very different. Yeah, yes, yes, different on the surface of things. But when you understand that, if you reduce things right down to their elemental form, and even the DNA of the elements are one, and I call that consciousness. And uh, there is a way within you, your own being, in which that just speaks as pure truth. It is not something you deduce only with your head, but it just resonates with the quality of truth, you can say. So. When things, uh, in the light of saying that, uh, when things appear, uh, some situations we don't expect or feels it to threaten our projection and our desire to live in, in, in the way that we 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 largely imagine, then it feels like oh, you know, it's a curse. Why are these things happening to us? You know, and all of these things. But if we change our attitude, you know, when you are seeing, in fact, from the deeper place as consciousness itself, every change, even those that come through strong suffering states, you may say, if you want, or felt to be mm, challenging, met with the right attitude in your heart, and as from the place of the impersonal consciousness. Everything can be transformed into a gift. It's just a way of raising to higher levels of consciousness. I really uh, wish to say this, because if we see it only personally, yes, it can be very gloomy. In fact, very, very uh, deeply unpleasant. But seen with the openness of consciousness, that is not trying to figure things out all the time, but resting in the in the might of your being, you see what nature is doing. And it is always, uh, you know, not just nature as in the physical nature, but the nature of, of the life, even through the mind, in its seen in the true light, it's, uh, it's blossoming. <laughs> uh, it's blossoming. Yeah. Well, that's it. Again, this other one here. This is still. This is the. You see, 
those who grow and you know have a, a business in olive growing would never allow an olive tree to go like this. This is just left to be a wild, uh, a wild thing. And uh, of course, it it is being natural to its environment and circumstances. Of course, it's tr it's trying to find the sun to get as much sun because it needs the sun. You see. Brambles are trying to take over. Yeah, the brambles also they you know they they crowd it and also add to the the lack of light coming through. This is what happened. When an olive tree is really cared for, not just for its fruit, but also for its beauty, when those who take care of it has an aesthetic appreciation for it, it is a glorious tree. It's the same thing with a human being. When we have, you know, a sense of the beauty of a balance and harmony of a life that a life that is that is expressed in wisdom and deep appreciation of its own source, a life that is um, rounded and healthy. You know, it's a yeah. Even the human farm is majestic, even because of the inner man, because of the inner one. You see. I don't know. I'm just talking like that. I'm not teaching anybody anything. Just saying what I observe. You know, just walking through the forest. You know, we lived uh, myself. I have to say, I was born in a place that's like a forest by the sea, and we never really appreciate it. You know, when that's all you you knew, when you you are so familiar with something, you 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 stop really seeing it and appreciating it for what you know for what it is. And uh, you may see others appreciating it. We used to have tourists coming to our um, our our town, Port Antonio, in Jamaica. Many, many tourists in the early days. Many Americans would come there. The ships would come and so on, and they love it. We have a a, a harbor, which is which is claimed to be the eighth greatest natural harbors in the world, and. Uh, Lots of bananas, sugar cane, coconut is shipped to different parts of the world from there. So people would come and you know they appreciate. And I even told you one time I said that uh, one time we were working, a bunch of children, you know, we were playing, you know, cricket on the road at the back of Love Lane. A few of us, I don't remember clearly. It's vague, you know. And some tourist people were coming by. On this quiet road, and they, uh, one of them said, "You live in paradise. You live in paradise." And we were playing. Oh, thank you, thank you, because we knew they meant something nice as a kind of compliment. But we could not really appreciate and absorb that. You see, you live in paradise. And it was only after many years later, when I had the opportunity to travel abroad, and first place I've travelled to is in England, United Kingdom, and lived there for some years in the in the city, you know, of London. And then the first time travelling back after maybe five years to Jamaica. And uh, As we are coming into a, along out of the Blue Mountains and along the coast, as we turn one corner, one particular corner on the hill, then the entire harbor and the town of Port Antonio comes into view. And I remember on that occasion, as the bus turned, and I was on the left side, I could see this this amazing scene. In my heart, uh, I felt this is paradise. <laughs> so, my point is that uh, actually, um, my point would be that you know, when you are so used to something, you you you're not able to appreciate it. You need to have some contrast. That is consciousness. Uh, this interrelated contrast. You go to some place else. I'm not saying London is ugly. London is beautiful in another way, but it's a city uh, of stone and and uh, you know concrete. concrete. 
We're coming back into the nature of Puerto Tony and looking and saying, whoa, now this is home, this is paradise, you see. And that, that, that is, you know, I'm sure that that experience really opened my eyes and kept them open in a certain way. So much so that um, a certain openness and a sensitivity and an awareness of my environment um, stays with me. And in fact, I've been happy to see that even in very harsh climate, and I, I, something sees a beauty in them. Living there may be something different, I don't know, but my eyes perceive a beauty, maybe because it also ceases consciousness. You know, and um, there is something as ah, if we are quiet, sometimes you can hear the the trees. That's not a bird. The eucalyptus tree is singing. You can hear it. I don't know why I'm tiptoeing as though the tree cares. Sometimes they are singing for quite a while, and it, it could be just a, just the body squeaking, or I don't know. But we hear it quite frequently, actually. And strangely, sometimes you think it's just the wind, but some, sometimes there is not not wind, and you hear them. That is groaning, isn't it? Okay, okay. Let's not disturb. Okay. So, 
if I may just continue what I was speaking. No? So about this um, the situation where I told you these people came and um, and said, you know, you live in paradise, you live in paradise. And we were saying, Thank you, thank you, but it didn't really go deeply for me. And that I must have been about maybe eight years old, nine years old, maybe in those in those days. And I want to tell you what happened some years ago, maybe four years ago, here in Manti Sahaja, we are having putting on a retreat, and a lady wrote, and she told me, I was watching a satsang with you, and you mentioned about when you were a, a little boy playing playing cricket or football, and uh, that some people came, some tourists, and said, you know, wow, you guys are lucky you live in paradise. And uh, she said, it was me. You see, in my mind, because she may have been a bit older than me, I just thought they were all adults. And she says, no, my father worked in Jamaica, in the Caribbean, and we were there with him. And uh, he, um, we went to Port Antonio, and I was the, the, the girl who said to you these things. And I want to tell you what, she actually came to Satsang. <laughs> what is that about? So beautiful. This is the ways of consciousness, you see. So beautiful. So that was about really sometimes not being aware and able to appreciate uh, not just where we are externally, but who we are internally. We can miss it entirely. And also, maybe for lifetimes, this show is going on. And, uh, but you are not showing up in your own movie. I told her so. Um, now she's singing now. <laughs> Pure opera. Look. It's not a bird, but uh, just <laughs> but just to share one last moment. I think it was the time when I said. Uh, I went for dinner. I rarely go to people's houses for dinner, you know. But one friend she invited me for for dinner, and I went in in Brixton, uh, in a little apartment above a shop on the high street. She cooked a lovely meal, and then uh, at some point, I asked, "Please excuse me. I want to use the bathroom." So she told me where it is, and I went to the bathroom. And on the way out, just before I turned off the light, I could see in the hall opposite the the entrance there was like a, a like a blackboard and on it was written some words and the words said mama how can i be sure that i am not already in heaven and that all of this is just a dream <laughs> so i hurried back uh, to the room and we sat down and I said, Please tell me, where did these words come from? And she told me, They come my son, my little boy, maybe five, four or five years old, he said that. I didn't quite understand what he was saying, but it touched some place inside me and I wrote it down quickly. And uh, so I said, Wow, it's amazing children, huh? Amazing. So some years later, in fact about maybe four years ago also, I happened to be back in London with um, with Mohan. We were going through the health food shop, and I saw the lady, and I said, "Ah, Mohan, this is a lady whose whose house I went to, with the saying, you know, Mama, you know this thing." And she was there, and she says, "Yes, yes, but he's denying it now. He he's, he doesn't want to know now uh, about that because he's embarrassed about this. He's not wanting anybody to know that. Can you imagine? Now he's kind of Mr. Cool." He's a teenager now, 
He doesn't want anybody to know that. So this is what happens to us sometimes, as in the Bible it says, from the mouth of children, infants, and crazy people, God will speak something. And keep this wisdom away from the learned people, the wise and intelligent people in our society, and choose little children, infants. I will speak those words, you see. <laughs> Reflect. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, let's go on. I said that uh, I saw a few times I've come in the forest and uh, I see one lady, one, girl, one woman, she comes to satsang, and I see her walking in the forest like this. Just by herself. And uh, there's an, an, an urge inside me to ask her, I see you walking in the forest like this, and something wants to ask you. Uh, do you, what what do you come to the forest for? It's because I see, like you seem to like to be quiet, quiet places. Is that a spiritual practice, or is it just you know? Well, please explain. Because sometimes I see people, um, you know, they need to be quiet, to be quiet, to be quiet. And I said, uh, really? Uh, it's understandable that if you work in a very noisy environment and so on that one appreciates a bit of silence a bit of quiet in one's environment outwardly at least you know but i often wonder if people are attached to there are some people they 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 move to the countryside and they they love quiet 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 it it seems like it's become like an obsession like quietness and it's a kind of uh, like they don't want not speak so loud or Or that the, the, the cat is walking across the, the road and I said, What is this? Because it appears as though uh, there is this honouring of outer silence, like by keeping the body quiet is keeping the mind quiet. And there may be something in it, I don't know. But I don't think the body being quiet is the natural route to making the mind quiet. I feel there's more strength that if the mind is quiet, you know, then whatever the body is doing, there is a, a quietness to it, whether it's moving quickly or not. I give an example that um, I, I am sometimes in some places in India. It's so many people, it's so much population in a place, and so much activity and the noise and the But there is a, there is a kind of harmony there. And one does not feel uh, uneasy about it. Something very beautiful in it, even if I can say. Now, I've also been in a certain place, I won't say where, but in a certain country, in a place that is very quiet. Some houses are there, and it's like very, very quiet. But I'm walking down there, and I just see the curtains moving, and you know, like you're being watched because you feel like. I, then I realize I'm a stranger. I was not thinking I'm a stranger. I was not thinking this is strange. What started to feel strange is this kind of hey, come out and say hello if you want. But it's just there was an un uneasiness, like you're being watched. So that was not quiet at all. It was like this is our quiet. Don't you come here and make any noise. And I wonder about that. And I'm saying this because I I, I know that many people feel that there there's a spiritual practice to 
to just you know be to be very mindful and uh, and that must have its own um, advantage and uh, somehow but when we make it into something uh, some external action carries so much inner implication i wonder because i remember one girl one time i saw her also she used to walk like this you know like this i saw her walking like that it was very uncomfortable some uneasiness in the vibe of it and uh, uh, one day we spoke about it and and, and say listen you know uh, what are you doing it, 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 and it turned out that she felt that you know that was that was a sense she had like that was something spiritual or something and as we talked more about these things and just say listen no it's uh, put your attention on awareness itself not just on the body and uh, when you see that whatever happens this or this it's all just movements you know they leave no trail and uh, you are the awareness itself relax sometimes naturally by the the flow of the vital force there's something very quiet and another time is very cool and everything feels to find their place everything is fine in its own time and its own appropriateness but if it's really a spirituality by the mind and then i tell you uh, very often waste our time you don't grow so fast it keeps creating practice after practice don't be attached and addicted to practice uh, not even the practice of learning sometimes we are studying books and learning oh it's a so fantastic book oh it's so fun uh, myself i experienced I didn't want it to finish. I didn't want it to, to finish. This book is so wonderful because I was also myself not much of a reader. And uh, uh, when the change came, my life shifted in such a profound way. I, I read the entire Bible first time, I should say, and it was very strong. Uh, I was uh, then the next book I read actually. Uh, big book was the the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, and I loved this book. I loved it. it. Was really speaking to my heart so much. It was lived under my pillow. Every time I wake up, it was like this, no? And that had a very profound uh, impact on me. But as time went on, and one ripens more and more into into real consciousness. I realize that there's a purpose uh, for reading is not just to enjoy. Sometimes if you're not careful you're doing something just to enjoy. Enjoy is okay. But habit and a, a, attachment and addictions is horrible actually. I will tell you that. Uh, the purpose what we must read is not just what the person did and what they said only but uh, who they are in essence. How did you, you know, uh, understand behind the words uh, you know and grasp because if not you're going to go to the next book and the next book and the next book but sometimes in one chapter or something i take the case of even the great one of the greatest books of all time sri nisargadatta maharaj's i am that if you read one chapter well if you read one you don't need to read the rest you may read it for for some joy and some pleasure. If you're going to read something, then of course read that. But in one chapter, if you read it, it is enough to get to. to he's telling you, listen. He was not making a book when he was talking. Sometimes different people coming. Sometimes he's just speaking spontaneously. He never planned. Myself also never planned what you're going to speak. He just came out spontaneously, depending on who was there, who asked questions, and so on. Then it was compiled, and when it's compiled, it can give the impression that uh, you know, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj was busy every day, pouring out. Yes, when it was necessary, and has it happened? You see. So sometimes it's nice to see when the master had some spare time and did other things that were not just talking, 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 and to get the gist of what he is pointing to. What he's pointing to? What is the quintessence of his teachings? And work with that, rather than trying to follow. Oh, this chapter said about this. This chapter said about. Follow and get the quintessence of what the master is sharing. You see, 
and then you find your way home. It becomes a mirror, not just a looking glass. Looking glass, you're looking through, and you're looking oh, like a window. Oh, I can see over there. But a mirror throws you back onto yourself. The Master's teachings, the quintessence of the teachings, becomes a mirror to throw, to throw your attention back in your heart. Thank you. Guruji, I just feel so full of gratitude for everything you give to us. So, incredible gift to the world. I, I don't have a feeling that I, I give anything to the world. You can say, what is offered? What is offered? I cannot give what is not offered. When what is offered is accepted, then you can say, I gave, I give. And this I that gives is really not person. It, the person had to be given up for real giving and real receiving to, to happen. You know? So there isn't a person to take credit. Whoever you may call Muji, if you see Muji as this person, this guy, he's not the one. He's not the one. He would be just a fake. It is just consciousness. And I'm not saying, oh, consciousness, go to con No, the consciousness is here. Consciousness has reclaimed its property. Okay? The consciousness had reduced itself to the idea of being a person. And the person became effectively a squatter in this house. It was not doing well. It did not handle the house well. So consciousness has moved back in. The person actually merged in the consciousness it really is. The consciousness is speaking. The consciousness is not a person. It is not personal. But it understands the person. And also there are still some things personal. Personal play happens here that creates a certain sense of uniqueness in this body and so on. I don't mind that. It's fine. I'm not trying to kill the person. You know, The, the person has largely become insignificant. It loses its um, singing tree. It loses its authority, so to speak. It's become um, a little bit of a foreign body. Okay? And uh, more, it's the same. What I'm speaking, I'm not making any claims. I'm saying it is the same. It's one consciousness. And the one consciousness here, as in me and as me, and the one consciousness in there is the same in you and as you, in the same one, uh, is somehow um, conversing with each other uh, to uh, and enjoying its 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 familiar oneness. That's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is very very, um, you know, important to say that. Yes, of course. Um, you know, uh, when the consciousness is expressing in such a, a magnificent way in a form, you know, of course, we naturally want to honor the form, uh, 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 but mostly because of the, what is coming through the form, not just the form in itself. The form is only matter, and uh, and the life force is only energy, but the truth is spirit. And all three are necessary somehow for this uh, this manifestation of grace and consciousness to 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 express itself. No? And um, but of course, when I say, it, then what difference is there between yourself and Papaji and Ramana? Uh, it's a difficult one to speak in the way that often the world listens. There is no difference, nor is there a difference. Uh, with yourself or anyone else, with uh, with what a sage truly is, but there's a huge difference in the fact that in one body the consciousness is awake to itself, and perhaps in another body it's still sleeping and dreaming itself to be something else. That is a huge difference in expression. And nevertheless, fundamentally, even in the greatest ignorance, uh, the same unpollutable and unpolluted truth. Is there 
in the, as the substratum. And if life is worth anything at the highest level, it is to awaken to that truth and to, to, to live in and as the truth you are. Like this. This is satsang, in fact. This is satsang. This is true religion, in fact. Is to find and worship the God that is also manifest in here. That's not a personal statement. That is not an ego-centered statement. God is everywhere. I don't believe in a God that is only somewhere up there. No, God is everywhere. That is my experience. God, if I went into the center of the earth and uh, and I find a living thing there, God is keeping that alive too. All this is God. The 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 living and the non-living material uh, is God. You know, and the wisdom and everything. It is it is the God self. It is the it is the the living con. Is the consciousness? Is pure consciousness? This is what I have to say, and you can hold me to my words on that one. There's so many things happened here. On uh, uh, maybe few people would be aware of what makes what a day could be like. One of my days. I am not aware beforehand. They are totally unplanned. But even where they are planned, what unfolds at the time of the, the hour of the planning to be executed, everything here is totally spontaneous also. So the plan is only written in chalk. What is written? What comes out in the end is something worth worth observing and remembering. And, uh, this unexpected unexpected quality uh, when lived from a place of inner silence and openness. I would say I cannot find a day that would be exquisitely planned and executed, could not compare with the inner quality and depth of one of God's days. I call it one of God's days, which is not, you know, which is not confined to the plans of the mind. <laughs> 